Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And sorry about those uh, technical difficulties we had. I hope everybody's um, on and can hear us loud and clear and can see the slide decks. Um, hey, I have to say I'm really excited about today's webinar. Um, today's webinar is Farm to School Menu Planning. And as you may know, I am Bob Gorman. I'm the Farm to School Regional Lead out here in the Mountain Plains region. And I'm joined today by Chef Kent Gedson. He's the Wainachie Food Service Director. How are you doing today, Kent? I'm doing well. Thanks, Bob. Hey, thanks again for joining us. Just a couple quick, quick housekeeping um, notes here, guys. Please, all questions are going to have to come through the chat function. That's located in the bottom left-hand side of your screen. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. We are recording this webinar, and it should be posted on our website within a couple weeks. So if you have to bow out or you can't stay on for the whole thing, we will have it posted on our website. After the webinar, we are going to send out a, like a thank you email, and attached to it will be um, some SNA continuing education units. We're going to send out a CEU certificate to everybody. Um, and on it also will be your professional standards. So even if you're not um, collecting your CEUs but are tracking your professional standards on your CEU certificate, will tell you what codes and stuff this webinar um, falls under. And here's just a quick picture of like the email that you're going to receive. Um, it's going to be in that downloadable section here that's circled in red. Um, just click on that and you'll be able to download your CEU and certificate. And from there, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Chef Kent. Take it away, Kent. All right. Hi everybody. My name is Kent and I am going to be talking to you a little bit about menu planning as it relates to farm to school. You know, kind of like how not to lose sleep over details such as budgets, menus, and product availability. Uh, there's a lot of material to cover here so I'm just going to jump right in. Hopefully you have, um, maybe possibly you've seen this web, this uh, uh, video that we produced a few years ago about our program. Um, I usually use it to start the presentation just so you have a sense of what, what we're all about and what we're doing. And um, it's, it's really well done. It's beautiful. The company who made it did a really nice job and so it shows lots of, uh, of uh, information about how Farm to School works in Wenatchee schools and a little bit of our history. So if you have a chance, take a look at it. It's, it's, it's worth watching. We also have other um, pictures and videos available on our Facebook page and our district website if you're interested in seeing the food that we're serving and the types of things that we're doing. I, have a, I like kind of an amateur photographer, so I like to catalog that stuff uh, that we're doing. So um, this next slide is talking about uh, the local foods we purchase, just so you get a sense of the kind of things that we're doing. Um, we have about 12 local farms and producers that we buy from on a regular basis throughout the school year. And uh, we buy quite a wide variety of things. And um, so it's, it's kind of fun. Our kids get exposed to a lot of really good fresh food. We have uh, some fantastic local producers that really support us. Um, the next slide is just really simply some cute pictures of kids and food and stuff that we're doing in our district just so you get a sense of the things we're doing. Those pears right there you see underneath those cute kids' faces are called sickle pears. If you haven't seen those, they're really cool. They're little, they're little itty-bitty pears. They're an um, heirloom variety of pear that a grower here in our, in our valley grows about 10 miles from our school district, and they're kind of one of those pears that nobody grows anymore. He's one of the, one of the only uh, growers of this particular pear in the U.S. any longer because of, um, you know, the way, the way it goes and... Um, farmer world, you know, they start, they, they grow what's popular, but these guys are still growing the cool stuff, so they're delicious. Uh, just to give you a sense of the, um, of the uh, growth of our program in dollars and cents, now this is just dollars uh, spent on directly purchased produce and um, products uh, within our local area. We buy when, when I, these numbers are what we spent directly with farmers. 
and local producers. Nothing to come. Nothing that comes from uh, Food Services of America or any of our big vendors. Just um, just our local farmers. So we've had a significant amount of growth in the last several years. We've really focused on farm to school and. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to get some cool ideas about how you can get involved if you're not already involved or how you can expand your program. That is a picture of um, some food we did last school year during our midwinter taste of Washington Day. It includes uh, local pork that's grown about 35 miles from here, local carrots that we do a little forward contracting with a, an organic farm in our area. So um, the guacamole is interesting because, I mean, who's going to serve guacamole at school, right? Because it's expensive. But that is actually green garbanzo beans, and it's a product that's available. Um, it's actually grown in Washington State. I'm not sure how broadly it's distributed, but it's a frozen IQF product. The peas, it looks like peas. It's just fresh garbanzos instead of dried garbanzos. And it's fantastic. And if I made a bowl of this guacamole for you and set it down with a book bag of chips, you would never know. I don't think you'd ever be able to tell that it wasn't uh, based on guacam on avocado. So pretty cool. And it really dials down the fat and um, makes it so that uh, kids get high fiber. And I mean, it's just also accessible price-wise. So very cool. Okay, so I love this picture, but um, I just want to introduce uh, the topics of the, of the day here. Uh, how not to lose sleep over the details that all food service directors probably stress out about a little bit when it comes to doing new things that are a little edgy. And so here we go. Um, there are so many challenges that we face um, in, in everyday work, you know, dealing with our staffing or, um, or you know, purchasing or auditors or um, you know production issues and farm to school just provides another opportunity to uh, face some challenges and uh, but but I want you to be able to think about just doing one thing if you can just I'm going to try to I'm going to try to tack on to every slide just like think about one thing you could do in your local area to to uh, overcome some of these um, some of these challenges that are are not they're not insurmountable. You can actually do this. So um, product availability is one thing. Um, I don't live in your local area, um, so it's easy for me to talk about all the stuff that's in my local area and how easy it is for me to buy products in my local area. And you know, when I first started, I thought it would be very difficult also. And so you know, there's a lot of resources out there to help you with this particular aspect of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the equation. Other districts that may be doing this in your area, use your, use your resources. Bob can help you. He's a fantastic resource through his, um, through his, through this, as like a state lead for the Farm to School program to USDA. Uh, if Bob's providing the same services that our local uh, lead is providing, there is just so much, um, so much available to directors uh, that are interested in going the Farm to School route. Um, product availability. Um, should be something that you can wrap your arms around if you just access some of these um, some of these supports that are available to you. Um, another aspect of of product availability is seasonality, and that's that's a real issue. Seasonality is um, you know most schools obviously are not operating during the summertime. Um, we do the bulk of our business in the, uh, the fall and through spring, and so. Um, the growing season is generally not alive and well in a lot of areas, and so that does take a little bit of planning. Um, something that you can consider is uh, things that we've done is are a look at what's, what is available um, in the form of forward contracting. Forward contracting is going to be one of those things that's down the road for you. It's not a starting thing. It's not a starting point for most people, but think about it as you as you move forward and find a school and um, consider that you could, the same way we do, cut a deal with a farmer. Once you've established a relationship with them and you know what they grow and you, and you establish some, some purchasing patterns, they're very, the farmers I know are very eager to get into situations where you project out that I need 10,000 pounds of carrots and 8,000 pounds of potatoes and, and maybe 3,000 pounds of cabbage in the course of the uh, upcoming school year, can you plant that for me? And um, 
you know, forward contracting can sound like a big scary thing. It's a contract and all these things, but to be honest with you, in our situation, we have handshake agreements with farms. No one is holding my feet to the fire. I'm not holding their feet to the fire. There's understandings that things happen in nature and all of those things. But the great thing about forward contracting is right now we're just, we're just getting to the end of our potatoes and our carrots um, that we forward contracted from the beginning of the school year. So we've had local product all through the school year. We'll probably still have local product up until about the time when asparagus starts to come out of the ground, which gives me local produce throughout the entire school year, which is pretty cool. Another fun thing to do is a little fifth season work. Um, if you've never heard the word fifth season, it just means putting up food for, for later, preserving it somehow. Um, for us, we do a really simple thing. We just freeze it, okay? We have a large freezer space. This may not work for you because of your freezer space, but, but freezer space, um, put, some, put up some blueberries, put up some cherries, put up some products that, that, come, that become available um, in your local area um, and uh, that you can hold over until the appropriate time. So for instance, blueberries is a big deal here, and cherries. So we've been doing blueberries for a number of years. I get a great deal on, on frozen blueberries from a local farm because he's got tons of them sitting in storage, so you can usually get a really good price on them, on a product that's usually very expensive. And then this year we experimented with cherries. So uh, one of my staff called me actually and said their grandpa grows cherries. I said, let's do that. I bought uh, like 3,000 pounds of cherries, and I put them into our freezer just like they were, and then we served them frozen. And we served them frozen on our salad bars, put out small amounts to keep them from thawing. It's like a little popsicle on a stem. Kids love it. So um, those are, you know, another thing that we do, uh, oh, local, local grown canned products and frozen products that are available to you. So possibly you could find some products that are available to you um, that are grown, grown locally and sold to your vendors. Like, for instance, we have a Truett Family Foods, which is a Salem, Oregon company, which is not in our local area, but they grow their beans. They buy their beans from um, a guy uh, 30 miles from here. So the product's grown in Washington. I just stopped taking the commodity beans and started buying the local beans, so that's pretty cool. Oftentimes, dairy products are also available that are local, like yogurt. We have a, a yogurt vendor that um, is in our state that we buy from, too. So there's a few ideas for you. Just pick one. Pick one thing. Throw some blueberries in the freezer or some cherries or, you know, any, any of these things. Just pick one. Uh, prices are, is always a concern for food service directors. We, get, we have tight budgets and we get, you know, minimal amounts of money for, for what, we, what we do. And um, hold on. Did I skip a slide here? I think I'm just out of order. Okay. So anyway, prices. So um, <laughs> prices are always a concern. Uh, if you would have asked me, if you would have asked me eight years ago, would I ever be serving um, uh, organic produce in my department <laughs> for my program, I would have laughed. I would have just laughed you out of the room and said, there's just no way, because my only experience with that was going to the grocery store and finding, um, you know, that, that it was five bucks a pound for the average run-of-the-mill, um, you know, organic piece of produce. But after forging relationships with our local farms and then and realizing and kind of casting the vision for them that they could get their products into our schools and feed kids well at an early age, um, and they're producing local produce, we're able to get uh, prices uh, you can't not believe for local produce because they, they're eager to get their products into our, into our, uh, our schools. So um, work on relationships, and I think you'll be surprised. I think the farmers will surprise you with their ability to um, meet or beat some of your big box vendor pricing. Um, the next slide, we're talking about finding producers. And, and, you know, like I said, I don't live in your local area. I don't know what your seasonality is, so I don't want to make any assumptions at all. But you can use um, other districts as a resource. The USDA uh, Farm to School website, Bob can help you um, locate local growers in your area. Um, food hubs are a fantastic resource for in some areas. Uh, food hub, if you're not aware what those are, it's just a place where it's like a clearinghouse for local uh, local producers to advertise their stuff, that, um, and you can connect with them through their website. 
Um, farmers markets are a great place to meet farmers. It might not be the best place to buy food because you know you definitely usually at a premium, but it's a great place to meet farmers. Go down to the farmers market, browse around, and ask uh, questions. Um, kind of speed date your farmer. Just walk around and and introduce yourself. I'm the food service director, and I'd love to I'd love to see if you uh, produce enough food for my needs. Um, it's a great way to do it. Um, we have enlisted local champions in our district. We've got a, a woman named Joan Causey who, who blows my mind, actually. We'd never be where we're at today if it wasn't for Joan. She does a fantastic job of partnering with us and supporting our, our efforts. She does a lot of contact work with farmers for me. She chases a lot of details and seriously would not be doing what we do today were it not for Joan. So find a local champion and enlist them in your efforts. Okay, so we're talking about local procurement now, and that is, I mean, procurement, let's just take the word local out just for a minute. Procurement in itself is a pain in the neck, right, for food service directors. We're under such scrutiny and using federal dollars and being, you know, uh, responsible and practical and jumping through all the hoops and the rules that are related to procurement is, is daunting. So I can, I just had the auditors, you know, for the last two weeks, you know, breathing down my neck. So I'm, I'm aware of those issues. So. Um, it definitely, you know, raises the hair on the back of your neck. So, but there are so many resources available to help you navigate this issue. And it's, sometimes it's a lot of dry reading and a lot of co even complicated reading. Um, but just ask for some help. Bob can help you. There's website uh, documents that help you understand geographic preferencing, uh, define your local area. There's so many regulations now written to facilitate local purchasing. It's actually becoming, it's a little bit easier, although it isn't daunting to navigate the words on the page. Sometimes it makes it feel like it's overwhelming, but really just enlist some help and, and take one small step in the direction of, of, um, of figuring out how you can buy one or two local products. Uh, let's see here. We're talking now about Okay, I'm going to get on my soapbox just a little bit because it's always a money issue, right? I mean, food service directors are always dealing with money issues. And one way that you can, you can, you can uh, get um, a little bit more bang for your buck is to choose fewer processed commodities. You know, commodities are free. I'm doing quote, quotation marks in the air with my fingers. You know, obviously they're not free to us. We have to pay shipping, and, and then if we process something, then those items are those processing fees are tacked on, and they're not all that le much less expensive than some of the products we can buy, the same products we can buy from our box vendors. So choose carefully. This year, uh, the last two years, I've chosen very carefully. Sat down with my management team, chose very carefully how we what what products we're going to buy and what products we're go not going to buy. We made some, some very specific choices to reduce the amount of processed foods we bought, and we saved $55,000 in one, in one, you know, from one year to the next in just, just being really careful about choosing commodities. And that was kind of blown away at the amount of savings there were. Plus, you can, you can actually serve better, healthier food if you consider scratch cooking. So that's my next slide, which is always a topic that's a little daunting. That picture is from our um, Thanksgiving feast at the high school the other uh, at Thanksgiving time. Um, real whole turkeys. Uh, I happen to have um, someone who knows how to cook there. She's a chef, and um, so we're not we don't always have those opportunities or those employees working for us. And scratch cooking has taken a long time for our district to to get traction on, but. Um, it's super important, and and we this this industry, food service, school food service, will never be improved if we just ignore scratch cooking. Please just figure out how to move in that direction. It's the best thing for kids. Just move in the direction. Pick one item this year that you're going to do scratch. Uh, eliminate one one commodity item. Uh, eliminate one thing from your menu that. Um, is uh, a processed food item and just replace it with something that you can be proud of that your team produces and it's not in, it's not I'm not saying it's easy but it's also doable if you just take it from a small bite so give that a try um, as far as um, taste testing goes we don't do a lot of formal taste testing one fun event that we do have a couple of fun events that we do have is taste Washington Day and we do a harvest of the month program every month so taste Washington Day is a, a twice a year uh, deal where we menu every one of our schools has lot local 
I mean, we do taste washing day every day at all of our schools. We've evolved to this. This is not an overnight thing, but we're always serving local product. But taste washing day is an opportunity for school districts who have not really gotten into this um, local local uh, purchasing thing to begin um, highlighting uh, local products on their menus on a particular day of the year. And it's a really great opportunity for marketing um, your program and for creating excitement and getting kids to try something new. We have farmers come and visit and we have, um, we have local foods all over the place and we do a press release and to the newspaper and we try to talk about it as much as we can. It gets on our Facebook page. I always take tons of pictures and do a little video clip of all the foods we did all day long that particular day. Um, always a great promotion for our program. Another thing is the Harvest of the Month. If you've never heard of that, it's just simply a program where you take, your, you take a product to an elementary school or a middle school and you just share it with kids at the lunchroom. It's not, it's not a, a incredibly um, complicated to pull off and it doesn't really interfere with anything. If you've got blueberries or you've got garbanzo beans or you've got carrots or you've got apples or something along those lines that you want to highlight, you just go to a school and you sample it for kids and they, they taste it and they enjoy it. We also do some fun um, periodic events called uh, hard, um, nutrition fairs where we, we invite farmers and you know we do some tables where kids can go from station to station and get a little five minute deal on um, exposing them to um, food things and where the food comes from and eating well. So cool stuff. Marketing your program is something that I just recommend that you do and it's kind of like a natural outcome of, of farm to school because farm to school already generates its own excitement. No one, no one thinks farm to school is a bad idea. And so if you just talk about it, I'm surprised at the attraction or the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, attention that we get from just simply sending off a, a press release to the newspaper, the local newspaper. They're often so eager to, to highlight those things because they're positive and they're, they're enjoyable to listen to or to read about. And, um, you don't hear good things about school food service in the news every day. And so these are opportunities to make school food service appealing and, and shine a, a bright, uh, rosy-colored light on the work that we do. Because it's important work and it's difficult to, um, to not have it carry that stigma of, um, you know, poor quality or unhealthy. So market the stuff. If you're going to do anything with Farm to School, then definitely make sure you market it. And my final slide is farm to school. Nobody ever said farm to school is a dumb idea. That's just nobody has ever said that. I mean, I get so much positive press and feedback from our farm to school program. It, it's amazing, actually. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to say that it's, it's been the biggest boost to our uh, perception of our program. And uh, that's all I got for you. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. It's all for you, Bob. Hey, thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Ken. Okay, I know right. we're going to run out of time a little bit, but I um, want to go over a couple more slides with everyone. We have some great resources to share with you. A couple of our partners, Minneapolis has a great website, has a lot of um, information about their farmers. Um, also, they also post a lot of their, their recipes and their, their menu cycles. Um, very highly recommend you guys check out Minneapolis, mini, the Minneapolis Public School website. And then, of course, the Ohio Department of Education. They do a very good job of seasonal cycle menus, and those are posted on their website. And it's a real <laughs> long um, web address, so I recommend just, just do a search of Ohio Department of Ed menus, and it will be like the number one search item. But um, do check out their site. And then, of course, um, my favorite is the Lunchbox. This is a one-stop shop for everything um, that has to do with local foods. Um, it will give you tips and tricks on developing um, menus and menu cycles. There's a bunch of scalable recipes on this website as well as it has some good um, topics on marketing and a lot of good training videos. If your um, employees need help with their knife skills, there's training videos on how to, to improve you know, your employees' knife skills. Or if your employees learn, need to learn how to saute, 
Um, there's information on their website about this. So um, I highly recommend you guys check out the, the Lunchbox site as well. Um, and from there, we would like to open it up to questions. Um, again, if anybody has any questions, if you would type them in the chat and we'd get right to them. So quick, uh, while everybody's typing in their questions, Ken, I did want to ask you one question. I did, we did kind of flip over a slide, and it had to do with um, your distributors. Um, can you briefly tell us uh, when you first started how like some of your distributors didn't really list local and what you did to, oh, yeah, yeah. to help that yeah, get we going? Used, yeah, we used Food, food Service of America, and I have just hammered on them for, for years now. Um, I know they carry local produce. I know they have it, but but we never would be able to identify it, you know, by by just looking at the order guide or by looking at the invoice. And so they don't do a good job of marketing that. But I've been hammering on my food service uh, company for the last you know seven or eight years, saying, please tell us, please send us an email, send send us a a fresh sheet, send us anything. Talk to your produce guys and ask them to send you a list of items that are local. And we finally, and it's not con super consistent, but about once every couple of weeks I get a, um, a little flyer in my email that says, this is what's local from Food Service of America. So, and then of course doing some research on your own, find out what the local, what, what's local and what's available, ask some questions and see if anybody's carrying any of those at your local things, at your local uh, vendor. We have um, uh, Auburn Dairies, for instance, does a great Greek yogurt that we use um, and, and, other, and other yogurt products that we use, um, and it's locally grown dairy products. So that's one product as, as an example. Um, the Truett beans that I talked about, grow, about buying earlier um, is available from our food service vendor. So, and, and I know those products are local. It's taken time for us to, to identify those, but just find one. Just find one product that you can buy from your vendor that's local. Just ask some questions. Okay, great. And I don't want to single out uh, FSA at all, but um, you know, uh, with a lot of food vendors, we, we've seen that um, they don't label their local products. But we have found that if everybody keeps asking, they will start labeling it. So I, I don't necessarily want to single out Food Services of America, but um, we, we've sort of seen that generally across the board. So we have some questions coming through the, the chat box now. Um, the first one, um, this comes from Anna Jackson. Any advice about training food service staff about scratch cooking? <coughs> yeah. <coughs> we all are aware that we, uh, we have a, um, generally untrained um, staffing uh, or personnel with regard to cooking, they're usually, you know, not trained to be cooks. Um, and so it's just baby steps. Once you start buying um, produce and things like that from that are local, um, you're going to naturally start slipping into the area where you've got to, you've got to start processing these things. I always start with um, pieces of equipment that I can afford that are uh, able to process large volumes of food products like Roboku food processors and things like that. And I train my staff on how to use those. And then I supplement with how to use a knife. Knife skills are, are um, important skills to, to have. Um, they're not quick to, to, to master, kind of like playing guitar. You've got you to go do it and get your hands on it and use the knife in order to, um, to get the hang of it. But you just got to start with something. Start with baby steps. Uh, another thing I do is I work with um, USDA recipes. I'll always go to as that my first resource. If we're going to do something different, I will say, well, is there a USDA recipe that's similar to it? And I'll take that recipe and then I'll tweak it a little bit to meet my needs. So for instance, we made chili um, with local pork. So I used a USDA recipe and I tweaked it um, to include the meat instead of ground beef. It was our local ground pork and, and a few other tweaks that made it work for us. And then I knew it met the requirements also, which is, you know, another, another burden of doing scratch cooking is making sure that your product that you're making meets requirements. So um, there's a lot of work to do with scratch cooking. And I, I don't want it to sound like, oh gosh, it's just an instant thing. You can do this one thing and everything's great. Because it's not. It does take a lot of time. But just find one thing. Start with something. A great place to start is buying a piece of equipment that'll 
make processing the food easier. Great, great. Got a question coming in from Karen. She wants to know, is your district allowed to buy produce from other places or solely direct, directly from local farms? We have, uh, I go out to bid, um, I go out to bid for grocery, produce, dairy, and bread uh, as a, a large major um, purchasing bid uh, at the beginning of the school, or at the end of the school year for the pr upcoming school year. And that is to get my big vendors, like, like, like I said, the Food Service of America, the Cisco's, those types of companies. Um, because we also obviously have to s supplement with, uh, we can't buy all local produce to meet our needs. We have to get through the whole winter. Um, so we usually, um, we're usually buying the bulk of our produce actually from, from the, 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 the big box vendors, but we buy a significant amount locally and we do both. So I, I send out um, quote forms to my local farms. Um, and ask them if they're able to, to provide any of these products or what products they have and give me a price. And then we also go to bid from uh, the formal bid process um, for those other items also. Does that answer your question? I hope so. I think so. Um, everybody, I know we're running a little bit over time. And if you have to go, I totally understand. But we've got a lot of chat questions coming in. Um, so we're going to stay on the line and hopefully, uh, Ken, if you have a few more minutes for a couple more sure. questions. Yeah. Oh, great. I got one coming in. Um, it says, we have had some difficulty establishing reliable connections with farms in that some of the produce is delivered dirty, unprocessed, varied amounts, um, not necessarily what was agreed upon. How would you um, address some of these challenges? I think that they just take a case by case um, uh, you know approach um, we've had times when we've gotten you know this new guy that's going to sell us apples and um, his apples were soft they just weren't the quality that we were used to getting we're used to getting you know super top quality beautiful apples and this stuff had been sitting in cold storage and so I completely understand we just talked to him about it he made another run at it still really didn't meet our needs um, but he took back the product, he replaced it. I mean, I give a lot of credit to farmers who are willing to stand behind their products. And in our experience, when we've, when we've been respectful and complained about it, you know, in a respectful way and um, tried to seek a solution and not just, you know, pull the plug right away, we've usually gotten some resolution to that. So, um, but, you know, the one thing to be aware of is the reality is the produce is going to come in from local farms. It's going to be dirty. It's going to be unprocessed for the most part. And that's just life. So one of those things that you kind of have to commit to is I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to buy one or two things and I'm going to start figuring out how to process it in my environment and, and um, wash it and all of those things because that's just the reality of it, you know, of stuff growing in dirt and out in the, out in the woods. So <laughs> I, hope that, I hope that answers your question. Great, great. And another one here. And they're curious. They're looking at some of your trays here, and there's, you know, you've, you've done so much with the local produce and local food. They're wondering how many years has it taken you to get from where you first started to where you are now? This is my 17th year. So this is not, you know, the first week or, <laughs> or a year or even two years. Of, I think it took me three years just to get my lips to break the surface of the water. You know, I was overwhelmed. I wasn't a food service director in my previous life. I was 20 years as a chef. So I came in with the skills and the understanding of food to, the, to a greater degree than a lot of my, my colleagues have. Um, I didn't have uh, the school food service experience or knew and understood the regulations or anything like that, but I had the food background. So that was really helpful in helping us to move forward. So, uh, and I've made an extra effort um, every time I have attrition in my department to, to hire someone with a little bit of cooking experience and cooking understanding and knowledge. And it just takes time. I mean, there is just no magic bullet to doing, doing that. Um, I just think about pulling my staff of 50 people together to do a training of any sort, and if I add up all of their their cost per hour and you know and, and fix a number to it, you know it's thousands of dollars per hour that I'm having to spend, at least hundreds of dollars if if uh, if I'm done math, math correctly. But if you think about it, one hour of staff training for my entire team costs a lot of money, so it needs to be really well done. Um, I always start out with um, doing pockets of training as opposed to bulk group trainings. 
and we just try to find ways that we can get the most bang for the buck. Um, you know, I, and I salute you if you're going to give it a go because it's so worthwhile. We've gotten so much, um, so much positive benefit from working towards scratch cooking that it's been phenomenal. Great, great. All right, and I do apologize if we weren't able to get to your question. Um, I know there's a few more out there, and what we're going to do is we will um, answer your questions personally via email sometime hopefully by mid-next week. I would like to remind everybody about our upcoming webinar, Farm to School Food Safety. We have Dr. Nowicki from Kansas State University that's going to be speaking to us on that. So um, for now, I'd like to close it out and thank everyone for attending. Thank you, everyone.